So let's start off with a word of prayer before we get into it. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity that we have, Lord, to come into your presence, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity that it is to hear your word, Lord. And we just pray, God, that as you speak today, Lord, you help me and all of us like to empty ourselves, Lord, to empty ourselves of our preconceived ideas of you, our pride, our ego, our flesh, everything, Lord, that stands in the way of hearing your voice, Lord. And I pray, God, and ask, Lord, that you use me as your vessel, Lord, to, again, speak through me, that it's not me speaking, but you speaking through me, Lord, that this is your church, these are your people, and that you deliver the word that you have to speak today, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray and we thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. So growing up, personally, I loved stories. I loved particularly adventure stories, whether it was movies or books or whatever it was. And it was particularly adventure stories because in adventure stories, there's usually the main character who goes on some kind of adventure, whatever it is. They overcome different obstacles. They experience character development. They eventually overcome evil with good, and they all live happily ever after, right? That's how every good story goes. That's how most movies and books go these days, right? There's usually a happy ending in all of it. And it was particularly my favorite because I knew in the end, these characters would overcome whatever it is that they faced and they'd always get their happy ending. So in the same way in our life of faith, we all go through these different adversities, different obstacles that eventually we do overcome with the help of the Holy Spirit. But we know also because God has already completed the end, we know that our end will also be good. Amen? All right. When we see the Bible, particularly the book of Revelation, which is the last book in the end of the Bible, what's the picture that we see? We see Jesus, he's seated on the throne. He is ruling and reigning. Evil is overcome. There is no death. There is no tears, no suffering. The ending is happy. It's a beautiful ending. That is the story and the image that the book of Revelation gives us and how our story is to end. And the story of faith... It's not just about us individually. It's the story of the church. It's a story how the church is overcoming and how the church is reunited with the bridegroom that is Christ. And they, there's the marriage of the lamb and they live happily ever after. But this story also includes our individual stories as well. We know that each person's story, it's unique. It's different. You can't look at one person's middle chapter and assume you know how the story is going to end. You can't compare stories. You can't compare books. And you shouldn't judge a book by its cover because you don't know what's inside. So we know the author of our lives and of our faith is Christ. The question is, will we give him the pen and allow him to write our stories the way uh, to write our stories and use us the way that he has planned. So every single one of us, we all have plans for our lives. We all have ideas of how we want our lives to go. You know, I want to accomplish this. I want to get this job. I want to marry this person by this age. And this is the plan that I have for my life. We all do this. Not a bad thing necessarily, right? These can be good things. It's a great thing to plan. We all want to be prepared for the future, right? But here's the thing. When we don't walk with God, and just a disclaimer, you can be a believer and not walk with God. Everyone who's not a believer, who does not accept and believe in the Lord Jesus, automatically does not walk with God. But just because you are a believer does not mean you are automatically walking with God, right? If you are not walking with God, you're not going to care about what his wants are, what his needs are, and you're going to do whatever it is that you want to do. This can cause us to choose to take the pen from God and to write the story the way that we want, the way that we think is best, because we think that we're a much better author than God, because we want to be in control of the plans and the ideas that we have of our lives. And what this can actually lead to is things like birthing Ishmael's. We know that Abraham went out of God's will, and he decided to say, God, I'm going to take the pen, and I'm going to write my own story, because you're too slow. We see also the example of the prodigal son who squandered his inheritance. He said, Dad, you know what? I'm going to take my inheritance early. I'm going to do what I want, go out and live my life the way that I have planned. And what happens when we we do this? Deviation from God's plan, it eventually leads to our own self-destruction. 
God doesn't inflict any of that on us. But what it is, is we actually fall victims to our own desires and we actually don't end up receiving God's best for us. Because what God wants is he always wants the best for us, better than we even have planned. In Proverbs 16, 9, it says, the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps, right? We have many plans. We have many things we want to accomplish and do in our lives, but it's actually God who ends up establishing our steps in the way that we should go. And sometimes God redirects us from our own plans, right? I've experienced that. We've all experienced that in some way. And we know that sometimes God actually saves us from things we think we wanted, but actually causes our devastation. We know that closed doors and redirection is God's kindness. It's his love, it's his mercy and grace. I'm sure, you know, just like me, some of us have maybe, we really wanted this one thing. We we had one specific plan that, you know what, God, I'm gonna accomplish this, but God slammed that door shut in your face. And you wonder why? God, I really wanted this. I've been praying for this for so many years. Why did you slam that door shut in my face? Have you ever maybe gone knocking on that shut door or maybe forcing it open, trying to see if it's really, really locked? I've done that. And what happens when we do that usually? You end up becoming burnt. Just like a child that, you know, wants to touch fire because it looks interesting and the father says no and they go and touch it and end up burning their hand That's what God is trying to save us from when he closes those doors, when he redirects us. When God redirects you from something that you really want or you really planned, will you fight and say, no, God, I'm going to go try to see if that door is unlocked. I'm going to go force it open. Or will you choose to surrender and trust that he actually does have better for you than even you have planned? Because God actually cares about your wants and needs, and he cares for the little things Carl actually gave a message a little while ago about how God cares about the little things. You know, like the plans that we have, the things we really want? He cares about that. Just like a child, you know how you take them to a store sometimes, they really want that one little toy? God actually cares about our wants and needs. He's not a cynical God. He's not an oppressive God. He's not a tyrannical God. He is a loving Father who actually cares about our needs. And this is the amazing thing about God. He actually, His will... It works out for every single party involved. It's not just a win for him. And oh, I have to suffer the sacrifice because it's his will over mine. No, no, no. God's will is perfect, pleasing, and acceptable. With him, his will, everything works out for our good. And our good also does include our joy and satisfaction. So whenever we bring a want, a need, or plan to God, he will say one of three things. He'll either say yes. He'll say wait. Or he'll say, no, I have better. Every single option of these, it's a win-win situation, right? Because God will work everything for good. He works all things for good, no matter what the outcome is. But what does the enemy want to do? The enemy wants to distort God's goodness and make us think he isn't really good, he's not a good father, and that his answers are cruel, unjust, he's mean, right? If God really loved you, you wouldn't close that door. If God really cared about you, he wouldn't redirect you this way. Why would he send you down this way? Oh, that that way is so much easier. That's what you wanted. If he loved you, he'd tell you to go this way. He would support you. We assume, sorry, when we limit God's goodness to a box, we don't see what he's doing. And we don't know what he's doing in the next page. We assume we know the entire story. And what the enemy also wants is to trick us to think God doesn't care. One of his goals is to distort our perception of God, and this in turn will impact our faith, and that will produce fragile Christians. Because what happens when your faith is impacted? You're not going to trust God. You're not going to be able to stand firm. You're not going to be able to fight. It's going to be essentially a sick uh, plant, like a sick uh, fruit that comes out as a result. But what God wants is to produce healthy, good, strong fruit. And that is what uh, is produced by having faith. So if we're not aligned with him, we're not walking with God, we're not going to want to do what he wants, and we're not going to care for his plans. That's as simple as that. So again, a question is, will we choose to ignore God's direction and do what we want? Every single day as a believer, we are given the choice. We are given the choice to choose to walk in the spirit or to walk in the flesh. 
either choose to walk with Christ or to walk without Christ. In Galatians 5.16, it says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Again, it's a choice every day. I'm going to walk in the Spirit. I'm going to choose to walk in the flesh. With God, without God. It's your choice. He's given us the free will to choose every day. Again, when we choose to ignore God, which is walking in the flesh, essentially, it will feel good temporarily, right? We're going to do whatever it is we want to do. We're going to live our lives, our best lives, whatever we want, right? It will feel good temporarily, but it will eventually cause our own self-destruction that God is actually trying to save us from. And we end up settling for less than God's best, which in turn causes pain. When we settle for less than God's best, we have to reap the consequences of that and face all these unnecessary hardships. Again, God will give us the free will to choose. You can choose to settle for less than God's best, but what God actually wants for you is his best. And that's the amazing thing about God. He doesn't want you to settle for less. He wants to give you his best in order to produce the happy ending that he has intended for us. Um, this is a Gen Z term. Has anyone heard of like main character energy? (laughs) This is a very Gen Z thing, main character energy. So I wasn't even so sure about this. So I'm going to give you guys a nice little explanation what Google and AI told me. Um, main character energy is the view that in every situation you are the main character. Your life is a movie or a book and you live with an audience and only the focus is on you and your own experiences and feelings. And people like this usually lack empathy for others and they have difficulty taking direction from others. So the question is, do you have main character syndrome? Do you feel like you're the main character always? Steph has both her hands raised up. <laughs> main character energy. It's a very harmless, harmless thing sometimes in our, in our young culture now. But if you apply this to, to the, our current topic, we sometimes want our own story, and we want to be the main character, and we want God to be our supporting character, right? To call on him whenever we feel like it, whenever things don't exactly go our way and our plans. Okay, God, you're, you're our supporting character in my story, and can you help me in my life to go the way that I want? Are we so focused on ourselves and what we want and our plans that we completely ignore Christ? We make him that supporting character when in fact he is the main character. Again, God is not calling a person, but his church. The main character is Christ, and he is the focus of our lives. But again, what does the enemy want to do? He wants us to stay stuck in this main character energy, main character syndrome, and prevent us from looking at Christ. And this way, we'll actually stay stuck in our circumstances We'll stay stuck and focused on one particular situation. We'll stay stuck in one mentality. And when we stay stuck, God can't work in us and through us. We're pretty ineffective in this kind of state. So we talked about what it is when we don't walk with God. But what happens when we do walk with God? When we walk with God, we become transformed. We become aligned with his wants and needs for our life. We are the supporting character in his story, right? So when you walk with him, you become transformed by him, and that heart and that mind becomes in unison with him. So walking with God, again, it's a daily choice that every believer must choose to make. We can choose to ignore him, or we can choose to walk with him. Walking, again, it's not automatic. It's an active decision, an active choice, an active uh, action. Being a believer, again, doesn't automatically mean we walk with God. Say you have two people. They're walking in totally different directions. Say I walk this way and Chris walks this way. Are we going to end up in the same place? No. We're going to end, it's not going to go magically and loop back together. No, you're going to walk in completely different directions. You're going to get to completely different destinations and you're not going to have the same goals and directions in mind. So, When you walk with someone, when you choose to walk with someone, there is a close proximity, intimacy, and unity that happens. And this is what God wants for us. I'm a big walking girl. I love going on walks. It's one of my favorite things to do, particularly with friends and family. Walking, uh, walks are very bonding. 
Have any of you guys gone on like evening walks with a friend? You usually have the best conversations on those walks, right? It's a sense of intimacy, bonding. You get to hear their most innermost thoughts, their feelings. You get to um, have a really great opportunity to bond with that person. And usually, you're going to the same destination. Say you're going to get coffee, you're going on a rest- to a restaurant, you're going to the park. You're both walking in unison towards the same destination and you're able to bond, you're able to communicate, you're able to um, hear and, and share thoughts and feelings and all these deep things, right? So when we walk with God, we have close proximity to him and we ha- we're able to submit to the will uh, and the author of our lives, right? So when we're saying, God, you know what? You lead the walk, you, you take the GPS, and, and he leads the way. Are we sometimes maybe getting upset when he says, let's, let's go the back route. Let's take the, the scenic route. Let's, let's go a detour. Or are you maybe a little impatient? Say, God, no, let's take the 407. It's way faster. Let's look at Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. Um, I really do recommend, actually, when you do get a chance, please go read all a chapter of Hebrews, but this is the particular verse that highlights the entire uh, message that we're going to talk about today. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. What do you need to do to learn in order to run? You need to learn to walk first before you can learn to run, right? So why does it say let's run with endurance? You can't do it without him. When we, like we discussed, walking includes close proximity. You need to be close to him, right? You learn to walk so that one day you're able to run. You don't just skip to the next thing, right? You need to learn to walk with him so that you can run with him. Both include a close proximity, and you need to stay in that close proximity so that you can look at him and keep your eyes fixed on him. And again, it says, for the joy set before him, Jesus saw that happy ending. He saw something. There was a joy that he was fixated on, that he was keeping his eyes towards that caused him to have that endurance, that he endured the shame, he endured the cross, he endured the hardships and was not weary and did not lose heart. Jesus knew everything that he would go through and everything that we would go through. And he knew it was worth it for that ending. He knew that it was worth it for that happily ever after that we would face individually and together. Jesus was trying to give us hope, hope for our current circumstances as well as hope for our future. That joy that Jesus talks about, it's that, that, that joy, that's the principle we need to apply to our lives. And that joy needs to become a reality and a revelation for each and every one of us. Here's the question. Are these just pie in the sky words? Are they like buzzwords that you hear? We talk a lot about these things in church, about glory, kingdom, crowns, ruling and reigning. These are just terminologies that we think we understand, that we think we grasp it, but it's not quite a revelation. It's not quite a reality to our lives and we'll say it, but it won't mean anything in our lives. It doesn't change us. It doesn't transform us. It doesn't fill us with any hope or joy. That's a question we need to ask ourselves because that was a very big reality check the Lord gave me, that's for sure. As sometimes actually, we can live as if the ending is not actually very happy, whether it's our circumstances or our end. We live as if, you know what, this situation that I'm stuck in, I guess it's never gonna end. I'm defeated, it's never gonna change, I'm stuck. This is just my end. My life ends at chapter six and that's it. Do we live like that? Because I do sometimes. I definitely do. We're sometimes stuck by the obstacles and circumstances that we face in the middle chapters and we assume that is our whole story. And again, the enemy wants to keep us stuck and to fixate on those things, to not turn the page, 
to see what's next, to doubt God and to doubt God that things will actually get any better. The enemy says, oh, your story's chapter six, that's it. You're stuck. God's not good. He's not gonna show up. Don't, don't turn that page. Stay stuck on chapter six. The enemy wants us to live defeated and under doubt. He wants us to stay on what is temporary, thinking that is our whole story. Are we maybe fixed on what is temporary instead of what is unseen? What does 2 Corinthians say? It says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Again, the enemy uses our five senses to keep us stuck on what is the temporary. Keeping us fixated on only what we see, what we smell, hear, taste, touch. That's our lives, just this realm, just this scenario. Don't, don't worry about what you don't see. Don't worry about that hope and future. Don't worry about what you can't hear, see, feel, smell, taste, touch. Don't worry about that. This is it, just this in front of you. But what does God want? He wants us to look at the unseen by walking in the spirit and not in the flesh to live by faith. Hebrews 11 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What Jesus did was he looked to what was not seen. Jesus didn't look at the cross. He didn't look at the the pain. He didn't look at the circumstances. He looked towards the joy that was set before him that was not seen, that was not in his five senses, that was not in this realm that he could tangibly see and understand. He looked towards what was unseen. He had that faith that needs to also be developed in us. And that's what it is. It needs to become a revelation for us or else this is, we're not going to have that same hope. It's going to be empty hope for us. Are we sometimes so fixated on that one particular situation we're going through or that one really bad chapter in our lives? Maybe you're going through a really terrible season of your life. Nothing is working out for you. Maybe you've gone through loss, you're going through hardship, you're going through pain, you're going through suffering, whatever it is. Are you so fixated on that one particular chapter and you think you know who God is and... Um, you think you have, the, sorry, you have these preconceived ideas of who he is and how everything is going to work out? Or do we trust him to just turn the page and see what happens next? When we know God, we'll believe that he's good and everything he does is good. That's what faith is. Faith is the hope of things unseen. When we don't know who God is, we're going to be confused and upset when things don't go the way that we want, and we'll protest like little children. Has anyone, does anyone have toddlers or, you know, babysat toddlers? I, I have pretty recently, and they're fun, but they don't understand a lot of things. They will play with sometimes the most dangerous toys. I don't know why they, they find the most dangerous possible thing and they will like run towards it and I can't understand for the life of me why. And so when you try to take away that dangerous toy from the toddler, what do they do? They start to cry. Why? Because they don't understand why did you take this really fun and exciting toy away from me? They don't get it. But God is the good father that replaces whatever is lost with himself. Whatever redirection, whatever closed door, he replaces it with himself. He told Abraham, I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. Even if what we lost, that redirection, that closed door, that circumstance, if it's replaced with nothing else but himself, his presence alone is better than life itself. Because if we have him, we have everything. He fills that gap. He fills whatever is lost. He fills it with exceedingly abundantly. It's that overflowing water, that overflowing well. He is that life itself. So when we have, when we have the Holy Spirit, every believer, when you accept Christ, you also receive the Holy Spirit. But what does the Holy Spirit do? He is our trainer. He's our comforter. He's our intercessor. And the more we listen to him, the more we submit to him, the better we'll be. And the better we'll be to overcome and to experience victory. 
The Holy Spirit pushes us and helps us to keep our eyes fixed on Christ, like in Hebrews 12. That when we face situations that seem impossible, God is on our side and will use those situations to bring him glory. God specializes in working out the impossibles. He is the God of impossibles that is able to turn any story around. Just when you think it's the end, it's God's beginning. He will actually deliberately use our weaknesses and inadequacies on purpose. He'll specifically make sure this is a very impossible situation that only I can overcome. And I'm going to use those inadequacies. I'm going to use those um, weaknesses to show my glory. Um, 2 Corinthians 12.9 says, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What happens when we try in our own strength? Meaning we walk in the flesh, not in the spirit. We choose to push God aside and say, I can do it. We usually experience burnout, disappointment, exhaustion. But when we invite him, we say, you know what, God? Come with me, let's walk. We'll walk together. What happens? When we invite him into our situations, it changes everything. We experience his victory, his true peace, his joy, his comfort, his hope. His power is then exercised in us, in our weaknesses. Walking with God and submitting to the author, it aligns our hearts with God and our desires with his, like we said. This is the work of the Holy Spirit to transform us. That's what he does. When we walk with him, the Holy Spirit is doing that work. We're conversing with him. We're walking with him. We're aligning with him. Our wants, our needs, our desires, our hearts, it transforms into him. Again, it's a choice. God does not want robots. He says, you either want me or you don't. I'm not gonna force you. It's your choice and it's your decision every day to wake up and say, I either will walk with you, God, or I'm cool. I'll walk by myself today. But here's the thing. Walking with God doesn't automatically mean a perfect, happy, successful life. Because what is required sometimes when we walk with God? Usually it requires a denial of the flesh. It requires a submission. And that's sometimes quite painful. It requires us to let go of things along our way. It requires us to be redirected from things we we thought we wanted. God, I want to go that way. And God says, no, let's go this way. God says, you know what? Remove that backpack that you have on top. It's it's slowing you down. But God, I like this backpack. It's nice. It's fancy. It has all these cool things. And I like it. I want to keep it. God says, no, leave it. It's sometimes a costly walk. But it's a choice. A choice to be the author of our own lives or to submit to God as the ultimate author. The circumstances and difficulties that you face in your life, the difficult chapters, it will all work out as we submit to the author and walk with him because he always writes victory. He always writes victory. The Lord your God will fight for you in whatever circumstances or chapters you're facing. He's writing the story. He's not going to let you go to shame. He's not going to let you have a horrible ending. He's not going to abandon you. He's not going to forsake you. We need to wait and trust him just to turn that page, to continue writing our story. Because guess what? God's actually rooting for us. He's rooting for our happy ending, and he's already at the end waiting for us eagerly to meet him there. So I brought some examples of... um, Impossible victories are chapters, you know, where you experience conflict with no apparent hope. And these are just some uh, case studies or stories that you can use as an example to kind of give for what I'm trying to say here. So the story of Joshua, you know, Joshua and Jericho. We all know the story of Jericho, how uh, Joshua was, you know, he told the Israelites, you're going to basically, God is giving you Jericho. However, Jericho is a giant city that is surrounded by these impenetrable walls. And so what appear to be humanly impossible, God says, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And so it required faith and trusting him. It was something that was not humanly possible. 
And so what did God say to do to the, uh, to, in order to overcome and to conquer Jericho? He said, walk or march around the city once a day for seven days. And on the seventh day, walk around it seven times. He required them to do something that appeared strange, illogical. It made no sense to them. How is walking around a city going to help us conquer the city? It doesn't make any sense in any human mind. And do you notice how they said, how, how they walked around the city? It was something that required a close intimacy and proximity to God. They were very likely holding the, um, the ark, which included the presence of God. As they're walking, they're walking with the presence of God because when the presence of God goes with you and you walk with him, there is nothing that can stop you. There is nothing that can overcome you because God's presence is what fights for you. Amen? Next is the story of Israel, particularly in Exodus 17, where the battle with the Amalekites, where Moses had to keep his arms up the entire time in the battle. Every time Moses had his arms up, they won the battle. Every time he lowered his arms, they would lose. And then it came to the point where Moses got pretty tired of holding his arms up. Like any one of us, after I'm sure a few hours, we'd be exhausted. So what happened? Other people had to come in to hold his arms up. What do we do in worship? We lift our arms up. Why? Because that is a posture and a position of surrender. And so that same thing in our lives where we need to be in a posture of surrender to God, trusting that he will take care of it, that he will fight for us, that he will win the battle. And sometimes that surrender can be a little tiring, a little hard. And so we need the support of each other. We need the support of the Holy Spirit, of our brothers and sisters in order to encourage us to continue to surrender, to continue fighting, that we will experience the victory in the end. And lastly, we have the example of Jesus. We know that Jesus had the ultimate victory, the victory over sin and death. He did the impossible of impossibles. What did Jesus say? Jesus chose to surrender and say, not my will be done, Lord, but yours. I'm gonna surrender to you, Father, even though it's painful, even though it doesn't make any sense, even though I don't really, maybe I'm sure in his human feelings, it was not something he wanted to do but he chose to surrender. And so we know that Jesus ends up dying on the cross, but we also know the ending. What seemed to be a loss or delay was actually the ultimate victory. He was an on-time God. Just because Friday comes means that Sunday is also coming. Friday will come, but guess what? So is Sunday. Do you see the principle here of waiting on him? Because again, from the disciples' perspective, it seemed like God has abandoned them. He's late. Jesus always came on time for all the other people that he healed. Why is he late for himself? Why is he not saving himself? He's an on-time God. So in all three of these examples, we see that the humanly impossible was overcome through three things. Walking with God, having that close proximity, surrendering to the author, and waiting on him to turn the pages of the story. God has a perfect track record of always showing up and always coming through. And it's usually, for some reason, always at the last hour. Has anyone else experienced that? At the last hour. I don't know why he does that, but clearly it's to teach us something because it's something that we can't ever take credit for because he wants the glory to go to him. When all hope seems lost, he always shows up. Because when we walk, surrender, and wait on God, he will write our victory because he always writes victory. Victory doesn't mean painless, easy, or unproblematic. But what it does mean is that in the end, it will work out for our good that we're going to experience victory. Again, you can take the example of warfare. Battle is not a simple, easy thing. You don't just walk into battle and say, okay, cool, I win, I win, the victory's mine. No. It's something that requires a bit of bloodshed sometimes. Every battle requires bloodshed in order to experience victory. And that blood that we shed through our difficulties, 
through our circumstances, it's actually necessary because it represents that death and resurrection process that needs to happen in us. That as we share in his suffering, we also share in his glory. That is also the story of our lives. That when we share in his uh, suffering, we'll also share in his victory. We'll share in that happy ending. The obstacles and struggles that we face are essential in order to become that overcomer. You don't just develop and becoming an overcomer from just doing nothing. You need to learn. You need to um, develop that. And that comes from that walking and experiencing and knowing God. At this time, we can actually call the band up. We're almost done. So we know Jesus was looking to that joy that was set before him that is described in Hebrews. That is what his gaze was fixed on. He knew that for the joy set before him, he endured that cross. He saw something. He saw a joy. He saw a happy ending. And guess what? You know when you like see a book or a movie and they say, spoiler alert? Spoiler alert, guys. We also have a happy ending that God wants us to be part of. And, to help, and he wants us to keep our eyes fixed on that happy ending as well. The spoiler is we know our end because Jesus showed us his end and we take part of that as well. As believers, are we saved? Is it, um, as believers, are we just saved and, having, and, and we're okay with just having a happy ending or do we wanna live happily ever after? There's actually a difference. There's a happy ending and there's a happily ever after ending. Let me explain. This means that we were made for just more than being just saved and going to heaven. We weren't saved just to, you know, float around the clouds and, you know, that's it. No, no, no. God had a plan. God had a purpose. God has an agenda in mind. We were saved for more than just being saved. Will we be part of that bride of Christ that lives happily ever after with the groom or not just happy ending but God wants us to live happily ever after you know you hear that in, in all these Disney movies and they lived happily ever after the prince and the princess got married and they lived happily ever after riding into the sunset and the horse and carriage and everything is great after that um, but I believe about a year ago Nora hosted a girls night where we watched Cinderella it was the new version of Cinderella I don't know if any of you have seen that it's a live action movie it's very cute but she highlighted something as we watched that. In the very last scene of Cinderella, you see how her and the prince, they get married. They're having their wedding and they're on this balcony where they're overlooking the city and all the town and the city is there. They're watching them as they're getting married. And Nora said something that's quite beautiful. And she said, God has called us to be part of that balcony bride, not to be part of just that crowd that watches that, that, uh, marriage, but to be part of that, to have that happily ever after forever. And again, that, that comes from not just um, knowing God, but from truly walking with him. Because again, you can know God, you can know about him, but are you walking with him? Are you choosing to surrender to him? Are you choosing to be that overcomer? Are you choosing to go your own way or to surrender to God's way? Because God has a beautiful story. He has a happily ever after for each and every one of us, but it's our choice to say, you know what, God? I wanna be part of that. Because as a believer, you will get a happy ending. All those who are saved, you will receive eternal life. That is a happy ending, brothers and sisters. But what God wants is a happily ever after, more than just a happy ending, but a good, perfect ending with Him. Just like Cinderella, will we be the balcony bride? Meaning, will we be part of that bride of Christ? Will we be that overcomer? Again, these are sometimes buzzwords that we may not understand. We may intellectualize in our head that we think we know. Will we be part of that overcomer? Will we be part of that remnant? Will we be part of that lover of Christ that is so in unison with him, that has that heart and mind of Christ, that we will truly be part of that something special, that joy that was set before him? Will we be part of that or will we choose to say, God, I'm gonna do my own thing? Because he'll respect your decision. He'll respect whatever it is you want, but it's our choice at the end of the day. 
Um, I'm gonna share just a really quick testimony here um, that this was last week. So those of you who know me, I'm, I'm very open because I believe that when we're open and we share our struggles, we share in our sufferings, it's, it gives him glory and it edifies each other. So for those of you who know me, know I struggle a bit with depression. And last week I was really struggling and I was praying and I was asking God, why don't I feel any joy? Why don't I feel any hope? I thought about the future and it seemed bleak. It seemed pretty hopeless. Any good thing that my mind could think of, it didn't seem really hopeful to me. And so I was praying and asking God, please give me some kind of hope. Give me some kind of joy to cling to something, God, please. And what God told me was probably the most comforting thing for me in that moment. It was a very validating and comforting response for me and what I was going through in that time. God replied, the hope and joy that you crave, it can't actually be found on this earth. What you're feeling is valid, but it can't be found here because you were made for more. And at that time I was listening to a song where the lyrics spoke to me so, so profoundly. And I'm just gonna read these small portions of these lyrics that says, it's a song called On This Side of Heaven by The Belonging and Co. The lyrics go, holy, my heart will sing holy with praise on the earth that the angels don't know. It's desperate, it's broken and searching for hope. Still, I'll sing holy on this side of heaven. And I thought the angels watch us with curiosity. Do you know that? The angels look down on us. They look down on this earth, this realm, and they watch with curiosity as the people of God go through life's circumstances and we endure hardship and pain and we produce praise in the midst of it. Because in heaven, the angels are continually praising God. They're praising God because they're in his presence and they know God and they say he's worthy of praise, but they watch us and they'll never understand or know that praise that we produce amidst our suffering. Our praise is valuable to God. It produces a, uh, amidst our suffering. It is valuable. And because of that, amidst our suffering, it's a sweet aroma to him and the angels will never quite understand that, but we get to produce this praise. And the rest of the lyrics say, one day we'll be dancing on streets made of gold. We'll join with the angels surrounding your throne no sickness, no suffering, our tears will be gone, but on this side of heaven, we'll lift up our song. And that is that unseen hope that we cling to. That the ending, it's worth all of this. It's worth enduring. Again, this, this is the beautiful thing. It's not just for the end end, it's also for the circumstances of our everyday life. God is a practical God as well as an eternal God. He cares about our everyday as well as our eternal. And that's the thing that we need to remember. Just a few reflection questions. Do we choose to trust the author to write our story, to bring it to completion through to the very end? Will we submit to him regardless of the obstacles and what events unfold? Will we allow the character development that the author writes and not despise the chastening of the Holy Spirit? Will we choose to just have a happy ending or to actually live happily ever after? And I wanna challenge you all. As we were singing in worship, it was, I, I couldn't stop crying because it was like the Lord gave me just a glimpse of that joy. And the challenge I wanna ask every one of you is to ask God to give us the revelation and understanding to see what is that joy that was set before Jesus in Hebrews 12. What is it? and to experience it because guess what? He wants us to, because that is what is going to push us forward. That is what is gonna give us the endurance to run that race, the endurance to, to deal with that, that shame, that scorn, that pain, that sorrow. And I wanna end on a really beautiful note, a, hope, a note of encouragement. If you're looking for hope, know that your story, it's not done yet. There is a future. There is a destiny and there's a hope that God wants for you. He's not done yet.